Welcome to our webinar on prefabricated loops. I'm your host, Dr. Bill Sowell. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be presenting the benefits of the inductive loop and detection technology that has been the gold standard of vehicle detection in traffic, parking, security, and access for over 40 years. While there are other well-known detection technologies that detect vehicles, they still strive to meet the accuracy and the reliability through all types of weather and environmental conditions by which loop technology is never affected. This webinar will present loops as the first half of a system and then present the different types of detectors that loops connect with as the second part of the system. Each part is integral to the system and each need to be considered a component of a complete detection system. Just as a video vehicle detection system requires a specific camera to operate with a specific video detection processor. This webinar will give you a better understanding of this technology that has long been used, frequently misunderstood, and typically installed with little knowledge or whether or not the loops were designed properly, installed correctly, and set up optimally to provide the best detection possible. Many people that were involved extensively with loop detection prior to the other above ground technologies becoming popular are either retired, moved on to bigger and better things, or have forgotten the fundamentals. While this webinar is not a how-to training, it will provide some basic understanding of why it is important that the proper materials and equipment are selected when installing inductive loop detection. The basis of inductive loop detection has not changed in over 40 years of use in detecting vehicles at intersections, entrances to parking lots, or secure areas. However, the advancement of the technology now allows for better, more accurate, and robust systems that will last longer than ever before and work better than was previously available just 20 years ago. The advancement of digital signal processing and microprocessors over analog circuitry is one of those significant changes and the other is the materials and changes made to the loop wire and loops themselves. We'll begin with different loop configurations and new materials available and then move on to the technology of the detector itself. The first part of the system is the loop. They come in different configurations, shapes, and sizes. Each were designed to do a specific function. While some work well, others were designed with little knowledge of how induction and inductive fields actually operate, so they didn't work as well as they were conceived to function. The most common and basic loop configurations are shown here. What are shown are the standard 6x6 square loop and diamond loop. Both function about the same while the diamond loop actually provides just a little stronger signal due to the way vehicles cross the wire. The round loop is a Caltrans loop configuration used extensively throughout California and in other places. Long loops, such as the two rectangles shown, come in various sizes such as a 6x20 to 6x50 or even larger and come in both standard, rectangle, or quadrupole form. Quadrupole was designed by 3M at one time to detect motorcycles more accurately by increasing the field height in the center, but due to the configuration was not as promising as expected. The field height is significantly reduced in the quadrupole and was not what they originally promoted. Once they found out the truth about field height properties of the quadrupole, they quit promoting the high field. Caltrans and Florida DOT both have extensive loop designs which they label and are commonly used in different applications. Other states have adopted several of these while they may not use the same nomenclature. The two to take note of are the two on the right and toward the bottom. Both were designed for specific detection to pick up motorcycles and bicycles. While both work well, they are hard to cut and install. Reno A&E has a different design which accomplishes what Caltrans has, but in a more simple design and one which is easier to install. This will be discussed later. 
While the technology has been around for a long time, people have forgotten some of the very basic and needs for a loop to work well. The next slides will discuss this in basic terms and functionality. We will be presenting a webinar later in the year which will go into deeper understanding of these basic requirements. First of all, there are some differences in what is referred to as a wound in the ground loop, where a contractor uses a spool of wire and winds the loop in the ground manually, and a preformed, or what we like to call a prefabricated loop, exists. First of all, there are several physical differences between these two types such as wire separation, issues with vibration between the separate turns of wire, movement between the turns of wire, and saw cut depths required for wound in the ground loops where prefabricated loops don't have any issues with this vibration or movement and require less depth for installations. Other considerations are how many turns are required for this loop, and this is based on a required efficiency of a loop, inductance required for the loop. The size of the loop itself will determine detection height. One fallacy most people believe is that the loop height increases by the number of turns used. This is not true. The height of the inductive field is roughly two-thirds the shortest leg of the loop, or in a circle roughly two-thirds the diameter. All of this can be calculated with very basic math, which again is presented in the Loop 101 webinar, which will be presented later this year. While the math is important, it's also important to note and maintain a record of certain information once the loop is installed. These data points can be calculated as well to determine that the loop meets the design and that all is working properly. The total inductance of the loop system is equal to the inductance created by the loop itself and the home run or lead-in length. This is also how the efficiency of the loop is determined, as it is a ratio of the loop inductance value divided by the home run inductance value. A measurement of the insulation value or MEG reading is also needed. Loops will fail if water ever gets into the loop, so it is very important to keep everything as insulated as possible. Splicing and installation should ensure that no weak points are introduced during the process. A megger will measure any electrical pass to ground. If, for some reason, these readings are below 100 mega ohms, the loop should be replaced or the splice checked. Also, a resistance reading on the loop wire itself is important and can again be calculated to make sure it meets the design requirements. All these values should be measured at the time of installation as well as during preventative maintenance to make sure that nothing changes. A clear indication of a loop beginning to fail is if the MEG reading goes down or the resistance starts to go up. This would mean that there is an issue with a splice or water wicking in the pull box or the wire which has been damaged in some way. By the way, Reno A&E has always recommended that there be no splices in the loop if at all possible. We understand it isn't always possible, but no splices should always be the goal. Reno A&E has been utilizing a technology of insulation specifically designed and manufactured for the inductive loop world. Other manufacturers and wire providers use technologies for wire and wire insulation that were developed for less harsh environments and not designed specifically for the purpose of loop detection. The use of wire not designed for loop detection has caused the loop detector to work poorly or caused issues such as crosstalk in the detector, false calls, and most importantly, failure of the loop itself. Reno a and a uses a wire insulated with cross-linked polyethylene, or XLPE. XLPE is an irradiated version of polyethylene, which increased the covalent bonding of the material to make it much stronger, durable, and water-resistant than the normal polyethylene. As you can see by the table, the physical attributes of this material is very impressive compared to the two most common alternatives 
which are standard IMSA cables. Water permeability is reduced over 90% from PVC or THHN. This is the most significant property to look for as we mentioned that water can be detrimental to the operation of the inductive loop. While the insulator is important, it's also worth noting that XLPE is much stronger than PVC or THHN. It resists cracking or stretching even at tight angles greater than 45 degrees. Most WITG loops require a chamfered corner so that the IMSA cable is not bent more than 45 degrees to prevent microscopic cracks in the insulation when the wire exceeds that angle. Also, the PVC or THHN can be easily stretched so the wire gauge needs to be 12 to 16 AWG to prevent extensive stretching. XLPE wire that is provided by Reno A&E has two benefits. One is that because the XLPE is so strong, the wire gauge is much smaller at only 18 to 22 AWG. This makes the physical size smaller, allowing for easier pulls and installations. The second is the advantage that XLPE does not crack at excessive angles of bending even up to 180 degrees, so no chamfering is needed in the saw cuts. This reduces time to install and complexity of the installation. There are several forms of prefabricated loops that Reno A&E sells. Please visit our website for the different types and applications for each. We even have a version that can be installed into gravel or dirt roads. The most costly part of installing loops is the saw cutting. Again, as seen above, the picture shows chamfering of the corners in order to install the standard IMSA cable. With prefabricated loops, this is not needed and would only add time and expense to the installation. Reno A&D loops are manufactured in a controlled environment in our facility in Reno, Nevada. They are produced by individuals whose only jobs are to make and test these loops in whatever configuration is needed. Each loop is also tested to make sure it meets our stringent requirements for insulation leakage. We test each loop to 10 giga ohms to make sure that the loop is perfect and ready to install. The primary reason we call these loops prefabricated and not preformed is that they have no shape to them until they are laid into the saw cut or nailed to the sub base. They come in small boxes and are easily handled prior to installation, saving time and cost for shipping and setting up. One of the most popular prefabricated loops is the PLB. It was originally designed for bike detection and retrofitting intersections on bicycle lanes and in dual use lanes. However, this loop can be installed for any application by 6x6 six six loops, round loops, and long loops, including quadrupole applications. With the PLB only inches wide and containing four turns, it easily fits into the standard inch saw cut that most contractors use. While some contractors use 5 16 this will not cause any issues with the use of the PLB other than more loop sealant will be needed. Because there are not four separate wires in the saw cut, as in standard applications, the normal three inch deep saw cut can actually be two inches and leave the same amount of sealant on the top. This saves money and labor as the blade will cut faster, it's not cutting as deep, and it also has a capability that allows for saw cuts that are not exactly what were designed with no templates. So if a contractor cuts a six by six loop uh, and it's a little big or small, the PLB can adjust to make up the difference. The PLB is very flexible even at low temperatures and can be installed in temperatures far below what IMSA cable is recommended for installation. We also provide a 10-year warranty on manufacturing defects. The installation is very simple and straightforward with just a few steps for the installation. The next slide provides a quick overview of installation of the PLB for bicycle detection applications in a city in Southern California. The contractor used a three-man crew which was able to set up traffic control and readjust two times to install eight loops at just over four hours in the field. 
Also, California requires that all the water and waste be vacuumed up so that no residue gets into the uh, storm system, which eventually flows out to sea. Here are the PLBs in the ship form ready to be installed. As you can see from the video, there are four lanes per approach. The contractor did the main street approaches. The loops have been laid out and are bicycle loops. The bike lane is shown. Note that we overlap into the adjacent lane for better detection. The contractor is cutting the loop and actually had to change the blade from the left to the right side and back again. Here the contractor is cutting the second leg of the loop and all the water is being vacuumed up. The third and fourth leg are being cut. There is actually only one sharp corner in a bike loop. All other corners are 45 degrees. This saw is one of the biggest and could cut about 10 feet a minute. The sharp corner is actually 135 degrees and is seen being drilled out with a one inch bore drill, which will also be used later to install the splice tube. Cleaning out the saw cuts and making sure there is no sharp rocks or debris left in the grooves is very important. The final step before putting the PLB in the ground is to inspect the loop and make sure there is nothing left in the saw cuts. The next step is to stretch out the PLB so that one person holds the splice tube and the other person holds the extended loop mid-length. This part of the loop is installed first and placed in the corner opposite of the corner where the home run is located. Once it is placed, then the loop is fed into the saw cut and pushed down with a pizza wheel. Do not use sharp objects such as screwdrivers, knives, or old saw blades. That ensures that no damage to the insulation of the PLB will be caused during the placement in the saw cut. The two ends meet at the corner where the home run comes off and the remainder of the loop wire is placed in the home run. The location where the splice tube lays on the home run is marked and drilled out with the one inch bore drill. Note that the technician is going all the way down with the bit at almost 18 inches. All the debris is vacuumed up to ensure a clean hole to place the splice tube. The splice tube is placed in the hole and held down with sand and then the rest of the home run cable is back to the cabinet. Sealant is used to fill up the saw cut and the final step is to fill and tamp down the stub, the stub out hole. This is the installation of a PLB loop. Reno a and &E also provides a version of prefabricated loop that has been designed to go under an asphalt lift or in concrete during new installations called a PLH. This loop is not adjustable, 
so it would not be recommended for saw cuts, although some contractors do use these in saw cuts. The wire is double insulated to make the additional abuse of having heavy machinery and asphalt come into direct contact with the PLH. These loops, if installed correctly, can last the lifetime of the roadway. It also provides a much cleaner installation with no saw cuts or sealant visible. The prefabricated loops or PLHs are held in small brackets in each corner. In some cases, if there is time and the logistics are set up, some crews actually saw cut into the subbase and lay PLB loops in the saw cuts so the next time a milling operation is done, the loops will not get milled, which would require the agency to replace the loops that would be damaged. Loops can be held down with brackets, ordered separately, or simply with mastic tape to hold them down while the machinery moves over the loop. The PLH has five layers of insulation and is 5 8 inches in diameter. This gives the added strength needed to handle the harsher environment in which it's being installed. Because the wire was designed with two layers of XLPE over the individual wires, it protects against possible scratching or abrasion to the wire that might be caused during installation. The inner layer of insulation will not reflect any damage experienced by the outer sheath. The very best way to install loops is to cast them into concrete. However, it also requires more planning, setting up because of the permanence of the installation. However, once in the concrete, these loops will last figuratively forever. This image shows the final installation before concrete is poured. As you can see, the loop is lifted off the subbase and rests on T's that have been placed on top of the rebar. This allows the concrete to completely encapsulate the PLH loop wire. The T's are available and are sold separately from the PLH if required. This is actually the quickest and easiest way to install loops and will last the longest of all applications. Here's a close-up of the T in place. The loop wire is simply zip-tied to the T and that is all that is needed. So as a recap, there are two basic types of installations, saw cut or underlay applications. PLB loops are for saw cutting and are recommended for retrofit or repair while underlay or PLH loops are used in new construction or when milling operations are being done and logistics allow for loops to be placed before the final lift is applied. When the latter is used, the loops will have a much longer life. The roadway will maintain its integrity far longer and failure due to loop sealant will not happen. We have developed a quick guide and calculator to use in determining if a loop is configured properly. It can be found on the Reno a and &E website under our support page. It will also help in designing bike loops, which are explained later in this presentation. We will now briefly go over the Reno a and &E line of detectors. Due to the time constraints of the webinar, we will not be able to go into full detail of all of the features and functions of each detector. However, you can find all of the information about each detector online at renoande.com under our products and then under vehicle detectors. The prefabricated loop information can also be found under our products under preform loops. Basic detectors are those which provide all of the functionality of the standard loop detection but do not provide any feedback other than whether or not the detector has a call or if there is currently an error or there was an error at one time. Dip switches are used to set up such things as the frequency of the loop, the sensitivity of the loop, or whether the output is pulse or presence, as well as if the loop is set to infinite presence. Again, these are all explained in the Loop 101 webinar we will be having later this year. These detectors come in both shelf or rack mount models. The shelf mount are called T-series detectors, and the rack mount models are known as G or Y series models and they come 
in either two or four channel versions. Of all the detectors shown, the 222 detector in the upper left is probably the most popular and used detector for loop detection. It is a standard detector of a Caltrans type and is used extensively in NEMA and Caltrans cabinet configurations. The more advanced detectors that are available do much more than just detect a vehicle. They can be programmed to sense the green indications and do different things depending on if the light is green or red. They also provide graphical feedback such as the frequency and inductance of the loops on the LCD screen for troubleshooting and diagnostics help. The shelf mount models come in one, two, and four channel versions. The L-series detectors are single channel shelf mounted detectors. The S-series are two channel shelf mounted detectors and the U-series is a four-channel shelf mount detector. The rack mount models come in two-channel or four-channel and four-channel width units. The C-series detectors are two-channel detectors and the E-series are four-channel detectors. We provide a width E detector if a high-density rack is used. There is also the ability to provide counts and directional logic with the C and E detectors. These functions could be used for such things as possibly wrong way detection or tolling. Since we provide a lot of detectors to the parking and access world, there has been a lot of development on the ability to determine directionality of vehicles going in and out of parking lots or secure areas. Anti-tailgating is another feature which has been developed and proven to be very effective. It's also effective that one car following another car through a gate with zero clearance between the bumpers would be picked up as two distinct vehicles. The directional logic algorithms are the same as what we use for our C and E series detectors in traffic. The most recent development for detection is used to detect bicycles. Traditionally, all loop detectors can detect bicycles but they were not specifically designed to detect bikes. A California law, AB 1581, was put into place in 2009, which requires all new or upgraded intersections in California be able to detect bicycles at all approaches at the stop bar in all lanes. Because of this, just about all detection technologies have developed bicycle detection. We have two different models, one which is designed to use existing loops to pick up bikes, and one which uses a specifically designed loop to differentiate between bicycles and all other vehicles. This is useful if the intersection timing includes bike minimum greens and bike extension timing. We can provide inputs to the controller or provide pseudo timing for the traffic controller. When bicycle differentiation is desired, several configurations of loops must be considered. Above are four examples of where to place a bicycle detection and differentiation loop for such applications. Note that the loop configuration is a parallelogram that is three feet deep at a 45 degree angle that covers the total area that's be considered for detection of a bicycle. We would be happy in reviewing plans or provide you with a referral to someone who can assist you in designing your intersection detection system. Also, the loop calculator previously mentioned will help in designing the right dimensions for any of these loop applications. We currently have many locations using our bicycle detection and differentiation technology, including but not limited to the cities of Phoenix, Mesa, Albuquerque, and many locations also in Oregon and California. This technology works in all weather environments and intersection geometries. Another technology that was developed for parking and access is also available for traffic. The automatic vehicle identification system is used to detect a specific vehicle outfitted with a hockey puck sized transmitter. This transmitter provides a transponder code that the loop detector picks up using any standard loop. When the detector picks up the code and verifies the correct code, it will output a call as required. There are several uses for this technology. It is less expensive than other AVI detection technologies, 
such as optical or GPS-based systems, as they are reliable for detecting vehicles. This technology is used in the Los Angeles area to detect buses to provide a low priority call to traffic signals, allowing the buses to get through the intersection more efficiently, allowing the buses to keep their schedule with more reliability. This technology is used extensively in the Las Vegas area to allow all emergency vehicles and public safety vehicles to access any gated entry either public or private. This is required by the Clark County Building Code to have one of these detectors at each gated location. An added benefit of this technology is that it is completely invisible to the monitoring public since the puck is hidden underneath the vehicle attached to the chassis, somewhere on the front of the vehicle. Because this is a technology most people do not know about, there is little chance of this technology being hacked as other technologies have experienced. This concludes our webinar today. We hope that you've learned a little bit more about inductive loop detection as a system. We believe that if the right loops and detectors are used as an entire system, you'll realize a much longer lifetime from both the loop and the detector, and it will also be far more cost effective. The system will work more reliably and not need as much care and maintenance as other forms of detection. I've also put contact information up on this slide. Please do not hesitate to contact us for more information about either parking, access, or traffic detection. Please don't hesitate to contact our inside sales group as they will be able to answer your questions or direct those to the appropriate individuals. Thank you very much for joining us and now we will go to our session with questions and answers. Have a good day.